on singing with me I wanna rock with the dudes to fear is no excuse so Baby, tell me what you say Hey everybody, welcome to 5 Minute Monday's Paving the Way podcast with your host, M-A-D-U-S-A, Made in the USA. Thank you for tuning in. I am really excited for a lot of things, but you know how I am with A-D-H-A-D USA. Medusa, actually get it, Dusa, A-D-H-A-D USA. Okay, I just, you know, that's me. That's going to be a t-shirt, I swear. Um, This is a guest. Um, that I've known now and worked with uh, for some time. I'm very excited to bring him on board. Um, but first of all, don't forget to make sure that you like our YouTube. Click that reminder. Make sure you do the little comments down below. We appreciate it. We also have some amazing, amazing uh, merchandise coming out, a t-shirt and a hat and a sticker. So that'll be available soon. So keep your eyes open on the website, uh, medusa.com. And uh, yeah, so before we begin with our guest, our guest is a really good friend of mine, but I need to bring on my hostess with this really great jovial personality. Hey, oh my gosh. Yeah, I am high energy. Yeah, you are dry. Dude, you washed your hair again or no? No, yeah, you had to have. It's a month. Yeah, it's been a Every month. Every once yeah. a month. Yeah. Once a month, you wash your hair. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you at least yeah. changed your T-shirt. Yeah, it's trademark for wrestling fans. Yeah, the or smell. Air wash, scratch and sniff. Whoo, Marsh is mm -hmm. here. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> okay. All right, guys. Um. So yeah, I'm excited this, about this one. Oh my gosh, so am I. So being in the entertainment business, I mean, uh, my my aspirations were never to be like a movie director or uh, to go to college for any of that. Um, it was actually to be a nurse. Um, so I was mending bones, then I ended up breaking bones. And then full circle, our guest today is Jason Brazer. He is a movie maker, director, screenwriter, um, a man with many, many um, talents. Um, we're going to get into how him and I know each other, the projects that he's working on, projects we've worked on, and then mainly um, about Mr. Um, Pappas, the Flying Greek. One of the greatest, I mean, I am so excited to talk about this um, for a number of reasons. Um, uh We'll 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 wait till Jason gets on board. But um, I know I have a couple questions, even though I know Jason, and I'm sure you have a couple questions as well. Yeah. So, um, without further ado, everybody, please give it up. Bring in a warm welcome for Mr. Jason Brazier. Yay! Hello. <laughs> oh, you say it like boy. You two are must have the same mother. I so <laughs> hello. We'd have a real relaxing time if we hung out. Yeah, yes, that's all right. I'm all for that. I'm all about relaxing. <laughs> yeah, I know. First of all, Jason, welcome so much for taking time out of your schedule. I know you're really, really busy. Um, you just got promoted. You're in a new job. And um, I'm very, very happy for you. Um, without giving things away and people don't need to know things, but um, you're working day and night um trying to spend time with the family um i know there's going to be a shift in the family situation for the you know for so much happiness there and um congratulations on all of that well, so that. yeah absolutely um and so we become like family jason and i and his family mm -hmm. over the years of working together uh so I am just going to first start off with how we actually met, and then I'm going to run into it, and then then let's end it with talking about the, the Flying Greek, okay? Yeah. All right. We both seen the film, of course. You know, I've worked with you on it, and uh, Marsh even got to see the film, and he has so much great things to say about it, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So how I met Jason, it was pretty cool. It was from Leilani Kai. Leilani Kai, I think, is the one that said, oh, you need to talk to this guy. I think this guy wants to talk to you. Or how, did the, how did that go? Did I contact you? Or did you contact you... me? I don't want this to be an Eric Bischoff situation. <laughs> no, I was talking to Leilani Kai about another female wrestler that I had discovered that apparently had been from Springfield and wrestled in NWA and WWF and all that. And 
then out of nowhere, she says, hey, uh, Medusa wants to talk to you. And I was like, uh, okay. And so I gave him my number, and then you ended up calling, and I was like, hello? And then, <laughs> then I heard your voice, which I had heard on television growing up and all that, and I was just like, oh, hi. <laughs> and uh, it just kind of built from there, really. And uh, yeah. Yeah, and, and yeah, gosh, you, I swear, you two could be brothers. I'm not kidding. Oh, my gosh. So, yeah, that was great. Yay. I met her. Was that, Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> How did you know Lani, 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 Lani. I, I I actually just reached out to her. I, I, I'm very much, if I need to know something or want to know something, I don't, I'm not afraid to reach out to people because the worst they can say is no or ignore me, and the best they can do is respond. And so she just happened to respond to me, and, um, you know, and now the rest is kind of history and kind of grown from there. Was that for a project? It's not a project that I've been wanting to do for a while. I just haven't had the chance to yet. Okay. He has many projects, just like any director. There's probably 10 over here and 20 over here, five up here and 30 down below. And this man has so much irons in the fire. It's, yeah. Sometimes to my own detriment, but that's just how things get made. Mm, okay. So, Mr. Jason Brazer. You have production companies and you started your own media companies or whatever. What do you, what is your production company? My production company is Flintlock Syndicate Productions. And that's where mo all your movies are made. Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. So you've made maybe short films, um, fantasy films, fiction films, love films, horror films, and documentaries. Mm -hmm. Yes. Wow. We're going to get to the documentary here that is becoming a huge success and um, rightfully so in a minute about Mr. Pappas the Flying Greek. Um, so from there, when you and I spoke, um, I'm sure you were kind of like, okay, let's see what this is about. I don't know, but I'm open to this. Um, I think I approached you to do a documentary. Is that correct? Yeah, that was the initial talk. Yes. Mm -hmm. That was about four years ago, three Three, three and a half, yeah, something like that. Yeah, it's been that long already. My yeah, gosh. Yeah, and we actually did. So hired a crew, put it all together, went out to Missouri, met with Mr. Brazer the first time and his crew, um, and we put together one hell of a trailer, which um, now that we've turned it into the book trailer for The Woman Who Would Be King. Mm -hmm. I mean, it happened for a reason, right? Absolutely. Yes, and Mr. Brazer himself is the one that did that trailer. So, I mean, it is um, fantastic, by the way. So, I um, with the movies that you make, I want to back up a little bit. Did you start growing up working with film, or is it photography, or did you, when you got older, did something just click on, and then you went to college? How did this all happen? Believe it or not, it was professional wrestling. What? What? Yes. Oh, I hate wrestling. Go <laughs> again. So what? Know. So what ended up happening was early on in my life, as I wanted to be a wrestler, and my friends and I, and I, you know, I discovered all these things about the business that some people turned them away with what kayfabe was and all this and. I came to respect wrestling even more for the behind the scenes stuff and the, what I call come to know as a live action choreographed stunt show. Well, my friends and I being stupid teenagers said, Hey, <laughs> let's put some wrestling matches on. But what we ended up doing is actually making storylines coming up with characters. And I ended up directing and choreographing um, the matches at the locations we were at. And we would all study stunt, <clears throat> stunt falls and stuff. So we could do stunt falls and try to be, so we didn't, Hopefully we wouldn't get hurt, and we were very lucky not, that we didn't. But that led to me doing live theater, and then the transition from there was me wanting to always pick up a camera and film, because I love John Carpenter, and I wanted to kind of emulate him or Robert Rodriguez early on, and I just started picking up a camera, and I just fell in love with you know, storytelling in that medium, and I just said, you know, if I just keep doing it, I can all, all I can do is get better. So... You're dabbling in it. You did some home movies first, right? Mm -hmm. What was your first home movie you did? It was called The Woods, and it's actually on YouTube, and it is awful. But I put that <laughs> on there because um, I taught some classes at Missouri State University, my alma mater, and 
a lot of these students were always like, I'm so scared of my first film. And I'm just like, you got to dare to suck. And so to make them feel better, I was like, here's my first film. How humbling it, though. I mean, and, when... <laughs> because you have to, you just, it, I learned that early on that even though I knew what I might do might suck the next, I would learn from that. And the next movie I would do, I would, Learn, you know, take what I learned and apply it, and then I know I'd mess up on something else in the next one, and then I would just keep, you know, repeating and keep going until, you know, here I am. I just, you know, I, I'm still learning to this day because there's stuff that I don't, you know, sometimes, and you know, the most seasoned filmmaker, even in Hollywood, there's going to be stuff that comes out of nowhere or left field that you're not thinking about, and you kind of have to just adapt to the situation. Jason, I think that's incredible that you actually took something, your very first one, and you're not afraid of failure because failure is not really failure. It's success. It's like, you know, like I've always said, it's failure learning. is not a destination. It's a blueprint. And so yep. for you to use that in schooling to show that it's okay, Ooh. it's okay that, I mean, that just warms me. Like I'd, I'd take your class just based on that <laughs> because I wouldn't be afraid. Yeah, well, and that's the thing I always wanted to do because I had bad experiences with um, some professors in college, um, and one in particular that almost made me quit. And because, I think we, yeah, we had that conversation one time. Yeah, yeah, and he won't remember it, but I, I always will. You because, always will. Um, and it was just, you know, he was this person was a documentary filmmaker, and I was interested in learning more about it, and so I was told I should talk to him. I walked in. And from the get-go, this person was just very off-putting. And then I couldn't even get a sentence out after he asked, well, who was your favorite documentary filmmakers? And in no particular order, I was trying to, I just said, the first thing that came to my mind, Ken Burns. And then I was getting ready to name off Warner Herzog and all these other guys. But I couldn't because he basically dragged me across the coals for 45 minutes about how stupid I was for liking Ken Burns. And that I didn't deserve to be going to that to Missouri State University. And that I needed to just leave. He literally told that to my face. What, and what what professor would do that? Is that just so? Oh, he, he was. I you know I've I've got many words I can use for him, but <laughs> um, I won't right now. He's retired now, thank God. Um, but I was even in the same building teaching adjunct when he was still there years later, and it was very difficult for me not to go talk to him. But I also knew that he wouldn't remember. It didn't right. matter. And so I took that experience to apply, apply to my classes, and I never wanted to um, You wouldn't want to emulate someone like that or teach like yeah. that and use it as example. And so I just started using what I had learned over the years of just picking up a camera, starting in high school all the way to that point, and I would show examples of like stuff from my web series that, you know, what I learned from doing this scene, how I could have done it better, how I've used that scene now. And then I would go back to stuff in, I made in high school with the woods even, or in the middle of nowhere, the one I made right between high school and college. And, um, you know, what I used, what lessons I learned from those films that I still apply today. Where, where can people go to the YouTube to watch all of these? Uh, just go on YouTube and look up Jason Brazier film. You, Flintlock Productions on YouTube? It should be, yeah. If you look me up or Footlock Syndicate Productions, it should pop up. Okay. All right. Just so people, you know, because right away when people are listening, sometimes they start typing stuff. So, hey, there you go. Yep. Um, so when you first started, then when you first picked up a camera, because we have different generations here and people that that are listening, we have like decades of different listeners. So was it the film you used? Was it film, film, eight millimeter? What what was it that you used? I, I started out on a old, old high RCA high eight camera that had like <laughs> those little bitty tapes like this. Yes. And it was really thick. And the thing about the woods is I worked all day filming that movie and I knocked the camera over and I thought the entire film was ruined. But I was so determined and mad about it that I still used it. And so like when you watch the film, you can see like the tape like going like this and it, it's just hilarious i mean I, I think i cried because i had worked so hard that day trying to film all this stuff and the movie is just downright hilarious amber my wife will always bring that up about how i played the demon voice behind the camera because i didn't have proper editing equipment back then so i did a lot of stuff in camera and so i'm behind the you know very evil dead which i love that the original film and i'm like 
I put some filter on and I'm like doing like this deep voice in the background from the like behind a tree, like or, or whatever. <laughs> and, uh, That's awesome. Uh, it, it's, it's hilarious to watch. And um, middle of nowhere is a lot better, but it's still definitely not the best. But middle of nowhere, we were actually able to pull off some stuff. And then I did a hour long Western my freshman year of uh, college because I was wanting to do something to challenge myself. And yeah, what was I, the name of that one? Your next one? What was that? It's, it's called the money maker. And that's also on YouTube as well. The full film. And yes. I, did, I did a 15th anniversary cut of it for fun, oh but my God. Um, and made it all in black and white. Cause I, cause even though I let my roots are in horror and all that, I am, a, I love classic cinema. I absolutely eat up classic cinema um sergio leone definitely was in, and clint eastwood definitely were inspirations in the money maker because it's very spaghetti western inspired and taught me so so much it was so fascinating i i, I go back now and watch it and i i'm conflicted with you know oh man it's hard for me to watch now with what i know but i also have to remind myself i wouldn't know what i know now if i hadn't done that movie mm-hmm. and especially with editing camera angles and just dramatic storytelling in general and how to move the camera to try and tell something dramatically without people talking all the time. So when you did those first two films, you only had one camera for both them films. When did you start working with uh, another, uh, with two cameras and, or did you hire somebody out um, as you per- progressed? Um, I, I always, ironically, I, I didn't use two cameras until I did the... Hey everyone, two-time Monster Jam champion and WWE Hall of Famer Medusa. You know, after years of abusing my body, I decided to trash that pain for good. I use Curable Active for all of my monster pain relief. Curable Active comes in and is easy to apply with your roll-ons, dry sprays, salves, and muscle creams. Order now at curable.com and use promo code MADTHANKS to get your 20% off. Drifter Lonesome Highway um, was definitely, it was kind of a, a um, sci-fi apocalyptic western. It was it dealt with the second civil war in America. And because I couldn't go anywhere and do like nuclear fallout because I was nowhere near a desert. So I did what was made sense to me. And we, that was the first time I used two cameras on a film was on that series and we did it on the second series as well and since then i mean i usually bounce between one or two cameras a lot of my documentaries i've shot with quentin have been on two Mm. as well so um there is that and i think it's all in who you know i i use the same camera i need to upgrade personally but i also am kind of nostalgic toward my camera because that camera was the first camera that we bought that has really you know, help me make some money in some very tough situations where yes. I needed to the most. And so I still use that what camera. It, what was it? What is it? What's your very first it, camera? It, it, the Well, the first camera that I, you know, when I started going professional or whatnot, I, I had a Canon 7D. And I've shot on that thing for years. And some people, because when Quentin uses his camera, which is a little bitty thing that shoots 4K, and here's my giant camera with this big lens on it. <laughs> and we when we edit those together, you can't really tell much difference because it's just, you know, it's all in how, I think it's all in how you use it, you know, and how you edit things together. If people are looking for, Oh, that's not in 4k and that's, you know, or whatever it they're, they're just trying to look for problems. Okay. So as a director, when you look for a film to do like your next project, how do you do that? Well, how do you know what your next film is going to be? I know you may have a lot of things in a bucket, but tell me, is it, is it something you see? Is it something you're feeling? Is it something? What is that? At this point in my life, used to, it just was like, hey, I have an idea. Let's just go make it. And um, the older I've gotten, the more I'm wanting to make sure that the story is something I want to do. Because I did do a project that I was excited to do, but very quickly I finished the project because I wanted to make sure I honored that. Um, and did my very best for it but it was it wasn't something I had written Mm. and some people are like well directors direct stuff all the time that they don't write and I said that's true but there's also directors that do just that and I find a certain connection the story's got to connect with me Mm. and it's got to um it's got to connect and it's got to speak to me and I kind of just go with my gut feeling like if I'm excited about doing it and wanting to make it happen 
as a director, then if I, you know, if I say that's something I want to direct, I, I feel something with it. Then you now, know it's going to deliver well because you have and you feel, you see, and you know yeah. the emotions and the passion of it is going to come out, right? Yeah, and I, I, I think too, even if I'm not directing something, if I find a project that somebody's trying to get made, they're, yeah. di they're directing it, and if I can, if it's something where I'm like, I would like to be a part of this, I try to, see, you know, ask if I can be of service or help as a, some type of producer or consultant or whatever, just because I believe what the story they're telling, you know, is worth telling. Mm. Mm, gosh, your mind is something else. Let me tell you, I've been through a few trips with you <laughs> late nights in the middle of the night, getting texts, you sending me these little oh, blurbs man. of movies and ideas. And, you know, especially going through the pandemic era, you were going all over the place. And I mean, all yeah. of us were going through our moments, ups and downs. I mean, your mind does not stop. It does not. I know. This, this thing is full of ideas, like my phone. I just, in the middle of the night, if I have an idea, I'll write it down so I don't forget about it. Yes. Um, I've started to take the approach that a lot of my <clears throat> more recent favorite filmmakers have done, like Louis Boonwell um, and those guys. They would sometimes write down their dreams. Yes. I have and a they, little notebook next to my bed. Yeah. And when I wake and, up, I have freaky dreams. Alan says, Deb, you should just write a book about all of those dreams you have in that book. Yeah, well, and I've got um, quite a few. I've got one that I have just been like, I would love to do it, but I don't even know where to start with it because I don't even know where to go to do it. But I feel like dreams are just my mind's, the mind's way of telling me something and i've seen so many films where people have put dream sequences that they've had mm. that like especially louis bunuel i love louis bunuel mm. um his films are very surreal but they always deal with something that can if you really dive into it makes you think mm -hmm. um, my favorite one honestly is called belle du jour belle du jour yes and it is about a housewife th 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 this is just the the top layer i'll just give you the top layer it's about a housewife who gets bored at home and decides to um, become a hooker in the afternoons. Whoa. But that's the whole thing that Louis Boonwell does is she's repressed and has been repressed, even sexually and everything. And as the film progresses, he starts to take away the wall of knowing when she's fantasizing and what's reality. Oh my god. So gosh. by the by the end of the film you don't know which Who's who? thing you're seeing. Is this her dream or is this whole thing been a dream? You kind of oh. have to go back and watch it again. That's beautiful I think, writing. I think I think that's brilliant. And I and I watched that film in college and I was that's the one thing quarantine did for me is I got to go back and re I reexamined experimental film and surrealism a lot. Because in college, I really didn't get it that much, but I had been doing some abstract art for a few years and painting, and I thought, maybe I'll get it. And it really clicked with me more than I ever thought it would. And that's kind of what I when I started ex even doing experimental film during quarantine. You said something interesting that you write all of the films that you've done. Is that correct? You have written? So far, yes. Okay. Yes. And I know you worked with other people to do things and have their input, co-directors and stuff. and. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I know you had, you spoke about your first film and second film and all in between. What is one you're working on right now that you would love to share, but not give too much away that would be something out of your norm? Well, it is going to be kind of a psychoactive documentary, but it's actually, um, psychoactive. Uh, is that a thing? Well, well um, <laughs> or maybe psycho reactive. Okay. <laughs> During the pandemic, um, it really affected my mental health a lot, and that came through a lot of my experimental film work I was doing. Mm -hmm. And when I when I say experimental film saved my life, um, I don't say it lightly. Um, and I know I've spoken to you about this too, Deb, but it's one of those things that it's very, um, you know people were telling me, Oh, I can tell you're dealing with some anxiety. You know, why don't you journal? And I, I couldn't bring my mind to write more than hardly anything. And I was writing a lot of poetry. And so 
I kept writing this poetry and I kept studying experimental film and I came across a guy named Jonas Makis who's considered the godfather of avant-garde cinema. But his films are unique in the sense that he it's almost like home movies, but he makes them into like these epic three hour docu like poetic documentaries where sometimes there's not any music or narration, but then there's times that there is music and then him reading a poem or talking and so kind of like a cinematic diary. Mm. And so I thought there's an interesting idea. And that's how I'll journal. So I just got my microphone out and I set it in front of me and I just talked about my entire experience Whoa. from right before quarantine to that point. <clears throat> and then I started putting video over it and I started doing it in such a way. I gave myself some rules because I was trying to challenge myself. I tried not to shoot too much new footage. I tried to use stuff that I had shot on my phone during the pandemic or my wife had or anybody and um, any of these experimental films and things like that. And before I knew it, I had like 45 minutes of this video diary cut. And then I started really noticing what people were going through. And there was somebody in our uh, family friend whose spouse ended up killing themselves after they had an argument and the kids were upstairs and it's, I was like, my God. And then I was trying to get into therapy because I wasn't ashamed of it. I just knew I needed help and wanted to talk to somebody. And there was a six month waiting list mm. to get a therapist. And I started thinking, well, this is like the new pandemic is people's mental, people had time in quarantine and this whole thing to talk, to really folk, like reflect on what things were happening with them. It was and, overwhelming for everyone too. Yeah. And so basically what I'm doing is I've decided to take this video diary that I've been working on and I'm going to basically record my, get, do an interview with myself and I'm going to basically do almost like a s autobiographical documentary about mental health and what, and what using my mental health as a journey to show people how I was able to use art through experimental film and they can use any art, but this is what helped me. And maybe, you know, it may not do anything for anybody, but my hope is that if, you know, even if it helps one person say, this is how I feel when they can't express it, maybe that'll, then, then it's done its job. You know what I see? So yeah, I think this could be a educational film. And it's done in a very experimental manner. Yes. Because the first 30 minutes I edited before I really got, the help that I really needed, needed yeah. and and the editing is kind of sporadic and kind of disjointed. Yeah, but that's so how I, you felt, right? Exactly, exactly. So I, I'm trying to keep that without changing too much mm -hmm. of that, so people can kind of get that um, feeling. But um, I'm just gonna. Uh, my brother and I are gonna record an interview with me soon, so I can start editing the whole thing together. I think and get that's incredible, Jace. I know you. I know what you went through. Late night talks. To I mean. Yeah. Man, I love you, brother. And his brother, your brother is a <laughs> may. I, I'm like, oh, I love his brother. Like the big crush on his brother. He's oh, a guitar oh, player. Oh, he'll, he'll, he'll smile about oh, that. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, that's right. He could listen to this. Could he? I have a big crush on him. But he's he's this guitar player, and he'd play on Twitch. And I'm at least, I'd be like, oh, can you play some more? Can you play some Led Zeppelin? <laughs> he's so yeah, great. He so talented, he too. Is. Yeah. Yeah, he and I have been through a lot and done a lot together with film and music. And I mean, the first thing he ever started trying to do was on Moneymaker. So some of the, oh, yeah. all the all the acoustic stuff was when he was starting to kind of play around. With he that. plays in the church, right? The uh, yes, yes, mm -hmm. yeah, amazing man. By the way, um, you'll hear some of his stuff, Marsh. Incredible, incredible. Um, so you have this knack of bringing people together. And um, if you haven't been told, you're an amazing man, Jason. Thank you. You are. You're, you are. You bring people together. You, you are a type of person that I would feel comfortable that if I was like in the middle of a shootout and you were there and I was dying, I'd feel comfortable dying with you and your family. You know what I mean? That's how you make people feel. I mean, how, I mean, I, also, I think, appreciate yeah, it. you know, there's this, I don't know if you ever think about that, not about dying, but I mean, in a good, in a, in a good way, guys, in a, shootout. <laughs> in a good way, like you ever think about God, I, you know, you're just in the middle of somewhere and you're dying, you're all alone or whatever. I think about if I had a choice, who would I want around me? 
You know what I mean? Yeah. Those good people. And it's like, okay, I know if I was there, I'd feel comfortable around these people, this person. And, you know, my group is kind of small who I love and trust. So, um, <clears throat> Jason, you're just, your family's just one of them. So, oh, thank you. Documentary. You're pretty darn good at that. I mean, we we did my book trailer and the trailer for the documentary, and it is a huge success. It's got a lot of views. Uh, plays on my Twitch channel as well. Um, and uh, uh, Marsh put some great stuff at the beginning for the book, and you know some ad additions uh, on the back end, and to use it for the book trailer. So yeah, credits are going to be uh, shown there too with you on there. Um, so. What would you say to an inspiring person that wants to get into the entertainment business of directing? Just pick up a camera. Don't ask for somebody else to do it for you. I had so many people saying, Hey, I have an idea. Will you help? Will you, will you essentially make it for me? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I would tell them, no, I'm say, And I said, if you're this passionate about the story that you're wanting to tell, I'm not the one who's supposed to direct it wow. and make it for you. You have to have, especially in this business, you have to have the drive to want to do it because it's not easy. And failure and I, knowing you're not going to make any money for a while. <laughs> yes. And sometimes, and sometimes, you know, you come to a point where you come content with like, you know what? I just, I'm just happy the project got made and that people have seen it, you know? And that's when it comes down to the art form of it. Mm -hmm. And, but sometimes, you know, even that one little one hour Western I made or, a t you know, attempt, <clears throat> um, it got me some of my first jobs. Wow. What about building and, relationships? What's that most important? Who are the first people or um, companies or is it in your own town? Who is it that you build that relationship with first? Like, well, for me, it was a lot of, um, actually, it was a lot of people in my church um, and that wanted to get into filmmaking or we'd been making films, you know, before I really considered that we were really trying to make films, you know. And so when I got serious, I, I brought along who I trusted if he wanted to do that. And uh, one guy is still with me and still helps out. He helped on The Flying Greek and Jason Coatney. Um, He's a my one of my best friends in the whole wide world. Mm. He's out in Colorado right now, and um, the, um, Summer, my daughter, calls him um, Uncle My Size because uh, he's shorter than me. Michael and Michael. and um, great guy, but he's been in every almost every project except the first Drifter that I've ever done since high school. And so I kind of have him as like a recurring thing. I like and he's your that. reach out to bounce things off of too, right? You always have that oh, right yeah. hand person. Well, we, oh yeah. Me and him, always, we talk as much as we can, you know, I mean, he's in Colorado now, but we definitely always check in with, we always have. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, you, you, you create friendships, you know, I met Brittany Greer in college and, you know, we ended up making some really great um, online content. Brittany Greer Twitter. is talented. Tell, explain yep. to people who she is. Um, she will rule the world. She um, <laughs> she's a, an amazing writer. I knew that from the beginning. She had the same drive I did, and we did season one of Drifter. Then we did Drifter Lonesome Highway. And then we did Stage Fright. It's a miniseries experiment we did that was all out horror, and we just went full tilt into it in five episodes. And then I still look back at that and think that's probably the best thing I've probably done. I just love what going back and watching it every Halloween. I always get nostalgic. And, uh, you know, then we did a series called Barker hole. That was kind of a crime drama. And then we did strange happenings. Yes. Yeah, strange a, happenings is out there guys. Yes. Can they purchase great, it to watch? Is that right? It's on YouTube. It's a web series. So you can watch it anytime. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. And, uh, we actually have a, Power Ranger uh, alumni in that one with David Fielding, who was Zordon in the original series. So oh, that was cool. kind of fun for us to have him in that. And uh, she, she's very talented. She is working, um, she's in post production now on a, her slasher film called Happy Halloween. And I've read the script actually two or three years ago. And it's 100% of Brittany Greer wonderful horror slasher in the vein I of everything. I keep telling her I am going to be in one of her horror flicks. My goal before, just one before I die, I need to be in a horror flick. I'd be good. Oh yeah, absolutely. 
yeah, and so Brittany's great, and she was the last project we've worked on. She worked on it. She helped. We produced um, Flying Greek together, and mm-hmm. um, then she's been. I've been off doing other documentaries, and she's been, you know, working on, you know, Happy Halloween, and um, she's fantastic. Isn't she a so. makeup artist too, or a? She has special effect makeup. Special yeah, effects, really, yes. Yeah, special effect makeup. She's really great at it, and um, isn't her brother or cousin in the business as well? Her uncle oh. or somebody that helped that that she learned from or some I can't remember how that, I, that I don't know. Okay, um, I don't know about I haven't heard that story. Oh, okay. I know she she knows a lot. She knows a lot of people. Okay, maybe that's what it was. She's very talented. She's very talented. But yeah, you 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 kind of build a family. Yes, you build you your circle anything. of friends around you. Yeah, yeah, that you trust yep. because filmmaking. I don't care what anybody says. Um, filmmaking is collaboration. <laughs> 100%. If any, I, I, I saw, I read, you know, in college, I didn't direct anything really. I observed other people directing, and I was always behind the scenes producing or doing something else because I wanted to see how other people directed. And so many people tried to run things like a dictator. And some of those projects never got finished because oof, of that. Oof. And some of the ones that did get finished were the ones who, um, you know, really, you know, were collaborative mm-hmm. and understood that their crew was there to help them bring their vision to life. And that's one thing I told in my class. I said, if you ever, ever say you don't understand my vision to your crew in this class, you're going to fail that project mm. because that means you are not doing your job as a director to get across what you need for them to help you make that vision happen. Right. So every director has their genre, like their their main that they're good at that what is yours what's your favorite that you seem to excel genre um golly um i mean right now documentary has been the big thing for me um i do want to get back into um some other types of stories but i really am trying to make it where it's um it's gonna have time for it really and documentary really works well for my schedule at the moment but what's your and, what's your love? What's your love? What's your passion? I, well, I love I love. I mean, documentaries are definitely one of them. But I definitely love I love period pieces. Mm. Whether it's whether it's um, western, whether it's seventeen. I mean, I, if I could do something redo Gone place, with the Wind. Oh no, I can't. Uh, <laughs> there's some there's certain films you don't want to touch. They burnt <laughs> they burnt they burnt the back lot down at W b warner brothers to get that shot are you kidding no that's true like when they're up there on the hill you see it's all that's the back lot of warner brothers on fire (laughs) oh my gosh that's a great little tidbit yeah and so there's little things like that i'm like man i wish i could do that what about the wizard of oz that's a classic yeah it's a classic but i will not touch that one either and anybody i like there's certain things like i just just don't don't touch no like i don't want you know but I also understand too, like some people give Rob Zombie's Halloween a hard time. Yeah, I thought it was I, incredible. I, I love that one. I love it. Some people don't, but I think his version is valid. Um, yeah. Because, you know, okay, he got a job. Hey, you want to remake it? He's sure, you know, and I had to put myself in his shoes. Okay, if I'm going to remake a movie like Halloween or slasher film or something, I want to put my own twist on it. Sure. I don't want to do the same thing. Like a Tarantino John- thingy. <laughs> yeah. And so. You know, the way he did it, I thought was a valid way. He made it completely the op- polar opposite of what John Carpenter had originally done. And I think it's a valid approach. But, you know, some people didn't like it, and that's fine. Mm, you're not going to please everybody, right? Nope. <laughs> Heck yeah. no. Um, okay, so one more question before we get to the Pappas is, you've seen transitions through filmmaking. We first we start with the um, silent films, the black and whites, and then the colors got into the black and whites, and then the speaking. And I mean, it almost changed. A, I mean, it ruined a lot of films and got a lot of films out of business and companies and whatnot as it goes through transitions. Now, fast forward, you see all of this digital. There is so much out there between Tubi and Netflix and blah 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 that it gives so many people opportunities to. Oh, I mean, you can't fail really. So you can actually no now I just saw that you can actually go on Hulu and and um get pay for buy a spot and you can put your stuff up on Hulu right 
and then well, yeah, it's like a do- yeah, you go up there, you put your film up there, and people buy it, and you guys share the whatever, kind of like you know, fifty fifty, mm-hmm. and boom. So, how do you feel with web series, YouTube series, um, uh, small series, like you know how they have these? Uh, seasons one and two and then they're done and that's the film now instead of just a film i'm it's aggravating sometimes because i want to see a film but now what they do is they take this film which i understand because i kind of like it now but i didn't before i understand it they make it into a damn 12 episodes one movie that's what they're doing with a lot of the movies how do you feel about that whole transition well film here's the thing the way i always looked at um film in general and history it it echoes and so like right now you know podcasting is essentially radio dramas and radio documentaries kind of reinvented and coming back into the fold the fold in a new format you know a new package but it's the same song and dance different dance floor if you want to it's like the way i like to put it and so with film i think that you also um have a um unique opportunity that there are a lot of outlets now but it's how you got to pick the right outlet i think that pick the right outlet that's right for your project basically yes yeah because you know i'm not a fan of people like there's a thing called aggregates and they are people they're a company it's reverse distribution you pay them and they put your film on um on the um whatever you, you program. Don't have Fine. program but you don't make any money off of it oh you just get exposure because you, you you just get exposure and i don't i i'm at a point in life where i'm like i don't want to pay for exposure i'm tired of paying for ex, you know because you know there's no guarantees even with that just because you're on netflix not at this point but, as much as you've been out there now you just want to get it out there yeah because on netflix you know if they don't have any money put into your project they're not obligated to promote you. Mm-hmm. You have to do all of that yourself. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I call it the bargain bin scenario. Like, I would go to Walmart every Halloween to go get a bunch of scary movies, right? And the bargain bin. And I would find these movies that I had not seen or heard of. And I would buy them. And I'm like, man, this is good. Why did this fail? And it's because it came out during a time when everybody else was making those types of mm-hmm. movies. And it fell. And so I think it's the same kind of scenario. That's a good with- point streaming is that i can go on streaming all i want but if they're not invested in me and i'm having to put all this effort into you know because all i can all i can say is yeah i'm on netflix and people be like okay cool but if i i'm not going to be up at the top appearing on everything like everybody else because netflix doesn't have any money invested in my project not just that not just that yeah. maybe you make the film when when there's a hot topic or hot you know you know you can tell what's going on in the whole fad of all these movies that are kind of the same. Maybe that's when you see that happen. You make a completely entirely different movie. And so yours pops out from the rest, you know? Well, there, I mean, there is a validness to that, but again, it also comes down to how Netflix's algorithms work because oh. the more, the more a film gets watched, the more it'll probably appear in their feed mm-hmm. is kind of what my, my guess is outside of, you know, whatever they put money into or bought to distribute. But I don't know that that that's the correct answer. I don't Mm. know. That's just my observation. I don't think there's a, you know, there are a lot of opportunities, but I also think too that it's like lightning in a bottle. (laughs) And because there's been films that I have seen in the past that I'm like, how the heck did this get made? Like, I know I can do something better. Like, I kid you not, there was a, it wasn't Patreon, it was like an Indiegogo or a Kickstarter years ago for a documentary about a guy who was just going to walk across film himself walking across the world with a sack of potatoes on his head or something like that. That's it. And he raised like, I forget how many thousands of dollars. And I'm like, why are we funding? I mean, there, there are outrageous ideas and then there's really good ideas too, but sometimes outrageous ideas can be good too. Don't get me wrong. But when you have films that, you know, the types of films that I've been wanting to make, like doesn't hardly get any traction on Kickstarter or anything. And 
So again, I think it's just lightening the bottle. The right people at the right time just have to look at it. That but, too, you know, but I think now that things are shifting that you can actually put your product on there and maybe you do advertise a little bit that, hey, it's on Netflix. And once that starts getting the rolling on social media, you know, I mean, again, you are one person doing it all, just like anybody does in any job, any profession, any yep. entertainment position. We all are our own independent contractor in our own company, yep. right? Our own absolutely, brand. Absolutely. And so until you get that feat, that network, those people and everything around you, boom, fast forward, here we are. The documentary, yep. which you love to do, um, you happen to pick up and made The Flying Greek, which... We so sadly just lost him to, to cancer. And I thank you so much for including me, having me be a part of, and getting to know such an amazing man. I wouldn't have known him if it wasn't for you and everything that he has done and contributed and the you know adversities that he went through. Um, both, uh, well, of course, I've seen the film many times. Marsh just watched it himself. Before we get into it, Marsh, you saw the film. Um, can you give us a review, please? I thought it was great to to see his like involvement first and foremost because because having the opportunity to watch it after he passed you can't help but think about how he just passed and so to be able to see how he wasn't just like interviewed one time he was so actively involved in so much of it he was hearing those things up front like he got to know that it meant a lot when there was a big gap of time it seems that he didn't think he had meant a lot he thought it was always cool when someone would recognize him or find him but the fact that there was this whole project around him i felt like it was just more and more special the the more moments you got out of it you know yeah. well and thank you how did it's... you get that project jason start there <laughs> uh <laughs> he giggles ser well <laughs> ser ser serendipity i was working on i was uh working behind the scenes on a t talk show in springfield that was actually being you know it had syndication across america hey everybody don't live with that monster pain trash that pain and treat it with curable active at curable.com that is curable.com use promo code matt thanks and receive 20 percent off at curable.com uh i worked on behind the scenes on this it was called the mystery hour it was hosted by jeff houghton and one of his guests one time was manoli savinas and I was working on behind camera and he started talking about working with Andre the giant and he started talking about all this stuff and I'm just behind camera and I'm just I remember staring at my friend Dave Smith, who was next to me down the, he was down below cause he was the MC and we were both looking like, how have we not heard about this guy? Cause we were both very unapologetic wrestling fans. And then he put the picture up that I'd seen before of Andre holding this little guy up on his shoulder. Yep. And I'd always seen that photo, and I'd always wonder who that guy was. And here he was before me. So I finished a different project up, and then I contacted him, and I said, "This is my, this is who I am. This is what I'm doing. I'd love to talk to you about this possibility of doing a documentary on you, and so forth." And um, we went and ate at um, a place in Springfield called the European Cafe. And I mean, he regaled me with so many stories of. You know, taking versing Randy Savage. He was talking about Dusty Rhodes. He was talking about all of these, um, um, you know, all these different just legends and icons. Yeah, and I'm just sitting here. I'm just like, tell me more, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. and uh, asking him all these questions and all his story. And I just was like, can I make a documentary on you? I would really like that. And he said, sure, let's talk about it. And so. We talked about it and we started that process. And I mean, it was about a three and a half, maybe four year process, maybe. And COVID definitely extended it longer than it needed to. But it was also the fact that I was trying to track down footage of him wrestling. And I strongly believe there is footage of him wrestling. It's just that it's the, all the archives I tracked down, WWE Network bought up. And mm. we even reached out through a lawyer just to be professional and to see if we could get a. I was hoping for a. A, a number to use it like a price or a solid no but we just didn't get any response Neither. and mm -hmm. so um but i know based on one of his fans did research and actually made a little booklet and i've got it at the house um of all his televised matches 
And so I know where he wrestled and when and who he wrestled and where he was at and who, who televised it. And I do believe that there's got to be at least one match or one clip out there, but I think WWE Network has it. I just, you know, I'm not big enough for them to, you know, I don't want to say yeah. care, but I just, you know, I, thought I, I, fall through, I would fall through the cracks, you know, and that's fine. But it, it challenged me to come up with different ways to film and to kind of bring the wrestling out. And so I did what I called shadow matches where I, he still fit into his gear. That is crazy. And so like at, when he, at the beginning when he's lacing up his boots, that's him lacing up his boots like he used to. Wow. And his jacket fell fit him. And so I did a lot of like out of focus. Like we did like a black backdrop with a light and some smoke and I kind of shot in and out of focus. So it was kind of like a dream sequence and like he was remembering like a distant memory and those turned out well, I thought. And, um, we, it was, it just, you know, and then he would remember something. And so I would, I probably interviewed him three, maybe four times because the more I interviewed him, the more he would remember. And, you know, and, you know, with any type of film, unfortunately you come to a point where you're going to leave stuff on the cutting room floor. Mm. And for his story, I didn't really want to do that. And so all of the unused, footage i have taken the audio out of and there's an audio documentary companion podcast where uh, it's kind of the stories that you don't hear in the film and it's kind of a nice little good uh companion piece and uh to the film project in itself but there's just so many stories and i still got a couple episodes i want to finish with because there's stories like when he got stabbed by a fan by accident Uh was he in mexico Uh, no Oh, well, that's I where know. I got hit uh, all the time with bottles. <laughs> I, 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 don't, I don't know if it was Mexico. No, you know, I don't think it was. It was either in Canada or here in the States. Oh, my gosh. But the person was like, he was beaten, getting his butt kicked by some heel. And one of his fans got really upset by it. And the crowd was just getting mad. This fan jumped the rails, got his knife out, and was going to go stab the, the, the heel. Well, the heel wrestler saw it jumped out of the way and it went straight into Manoli's shoulder and he could still see the you could still see the um the scar scar yeah oh he showed me oh my gosh and so that wasn't in the film right. but i'm trying to get it you know into that you know um it's 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 going to be in the audio companion piece because it's just something that needs to be preserved and I want to preserve it. Absolutely. So, yeah. You did a beautiful job. So now for people, now you're looking into distribution and putting it out. Is that right? What are you doing with the film? Uh, yeah, but I'm looking at options right now for distribution and where okay. I want to try and, get, you know, what matters to me is it just uh, that his story is out there for his fans and family and yeah. friends to enjoy. And so I'm trying to figure out the best, you know, route to take that. You will. It's in good hands. It's in the perfect hands. That's for sure. Yeah. Well, thank yeah. you. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. It was such an, a great honor as well. We had um, a showing at the theater there. Um, it was at a vintage theater, which was kind of cool. Yeah, and, it was a lot in Springfield. Yeah, oh. and we had everybody there and had the, you know, the meet and greet with him and the opportunity to everybody to watch it and meet it. And then they spoke afterwards and he received an award from CAC. Um, courage award i believe and so that was a huge honor um and i know he enjoyed everything everything you did for him and his family it just you just put everything there was another together. award there was another award he got too do you think that your documentary helped shine the light back on him enough to to get a few of these extra accolades i, I mean i would i mean i don't want to take credit for that by any means because but, but, I, 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 but yeah but i mean i think it's it definitely helped get his name Absolutely. back out there some people and um, which is what happened because I remember him even telling me that you know he there, there's a part in the film that is my favorite part and it's when he I got him to go in the ring and show me some moves and he mm-hmm. kicks my butt all around the ring I love that day and the thing is the reason why I cherish that so much is because I remember him telling me early on in the interview that people would always come to him to, for him to train them over the years and he would never do it. He was just done with the wrestling business. He didn't want to do it. Mm -hmm. And here I am. And he's like, here, come here. And he's like teaching me how to throw forearms. And he's like doing all, and I'm just like, Oh my God, like he's (laughs) actually trying to show me stuff. And so I didn't know it was going to go that in depth. And he was showing me these different things and we were walking through and like doing the lock. And I mean, it was just, um, you know, 
I think, you know, I think I was the last person in the ring with him. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. And then we had, then we had lunch with him too. Yeah. Oh God. He's God. I miss him already. It's, um, I'll tell you, he was a fighter all the way to the end, boy. He was walking around. Oh yeah. And even at that last screening, he was, and I knew it was, he was looking rough, but he was, uh, he made me nervous because I could tell he was still wanting to run a hundred miles an hour. And I was just like, Manoli, you can't, I'm sorry, you know? And so I would be like walking behind him, like just trying to make sure I was there in case he needed, you know, the extra hand or whatnot. And, um, I will share that what I, and I told you this the other day, Deuce, but like, I, I actually got to say bye to him. Oh. And, um, he, he died from the same thing my grandfather died from years ago. Mm. And I never got to tell my grandfather bye. But I went to visit on the 26th of December. And they were trying to have me speak. He was, he was speaking in Greek a lot when he woke up. And so they were trying to get me to say Greek words to try and see if I can wake him up. But me and my Ozark Hills dialect, I know I murdered that completely and all that. But... Um, at one point we were talking about the film and I knew under sedation, sometimes they can hear you. And so I told, I was tell there, his daughters were asking me my favorite part and I was telling them it was the part in the ring. And he, um, and when he was kicking my butt around the ring and I looked over and he was smiling. So I knew he could hear me. Yeah. And later on, I just kind of talked with Constantina, one of his daughters. And I said, will you go in there with me? Cause I feel like if I don't say bye, I'll, I'll regret it. And so she was trying to gently wake him up saying some things in Greek that I don't even know, but he wouldn't wake up. And so I just said, I'm going to try. I just leaned over and I said, Hey, Manoli. And his eyes just opened. Oh my gosh. He looked over at Constantina and she goes, she was smiling at him. She goes, Hey, Jason's here to see you. And he shook his head. And then he said a, a Greek word that meant cold. So we actually got a blanket, and, you know, to get him warm. And she goes, well, Jason's here to talk to you. And he looked over at me and gave me his full attention and I told him that it was my honor to preserve your story. I'm glad to have known you and had you in my life. And, um, you know, I'll never forget you. I love you. And I just want you to rest easy. Aww. And I don't know if there's, um, sorry, a better way to end that chapter because I think that's perfect. he he looked at me and he didn't say a word <laughs> all he did was he just nodded his head very regally toward me and then he laid his head back and closed his eyes and that was it for jason i left and i it was you know he held on for a, a few more days like a i think about five more days i think four or five mm-hmm. after that but um i'm glad i said it when i when I did. And it also helped me give some closure with my grandfather, actually too, that I never got to say bye. It just kind of helped me come full circle in that, I guess. And, um, you know, people, some some people say that film doesn't matter and that films don't make a difference. And Mm -hmm. I could sit here and name about 10 films that have made a difference in history and people's lives, but art affects everybody differently. It meets everybody where they are in their life. You can all, we can all go look in a, museum and look at a painting and we all would interpret it differently because it's meeting us where we are in our lives at that moment and we may go back 10 years later and it will mean something different but that's what art does and filmmaking is an art form and documentary is probably the most perfect preser- way of preserving somebody's story in a very creative manner and at the end of the day it's one of those things where i'm like if i just you know I've done my job. Uh, Really. I really felt like the first time in my career, I was like, okay, this I've done what I need. This is like done my job, I guess, you know, it really went beyond just the filmmaking aspect of it. I had actually preserved. You preserved Mr. Manoli. And I mean, and you did it well. And I think this is, this is amazing. I think this is a great ending to a, a great interview. Um, You've you've got so much ahead of you, Jason. I know there's good things coming. And you and I have spoke ad nauseum at this, like, do not give up in the most crucial 
times in your life when you think it's just not. That's when it is. You know, that's when you pull out your best at those moments of uncertainty. That's when you find things that you never seen before. They may be uncomfortable, but those uncomfortable situations is what's going to preserve you as a person and a director and um, the moments of growth. I'm very excited. I'm excited for you. I'm excited to know you. And um, it's been a pleasure. And I know we got some great things coming in the future. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. Oh, you're so welcome. Marsh, you have anything else? No, I just... Uh, you're just it, amazing personality? Yeah. I mean, th- that was the... It's kind of the question I was going for. It was like, he got the opportunity to shine a spotlight on someone who really deserved that spotlight and never was given it that way you did i mean that was the beauty of it all was that you could just see that it was all preserved in such an amazing way that you're like this is perfect at what it's doing kudos he's he he was the ray mysterio of his time let's just put it like that (laughs) he was and i kid you not we were at a wwe event in springfield and he was in the front row and he got to see ray mysterio come out and wrestle Mm. and as soon as we were at a break at the live event he waved me down. He goes, that's what I used to do. He was so excited about Rey Mysterio. Oh, my gosh. He's like, I, that's exactly what I used to do. That's me. That's I, me 50 yeah. years ago. <laughs> that's, that, that's what he did. And it's true. I mean, I, the pictures of him and his drop kicks that he would do were yeah. so high and perfect yes. like, level. I was like, man, you don't even get that today. You what, you're like, right. You did capture that, right? He was the Rey Mysterio before Rey was Rey Mysterio. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Jason, so much. So we'll make sure that we have all your links and everything. Um, make sure Marsh gets that. Um, okay, and we'll put it up and everything. We'll let you know all that good stuff. Yeah. Sounds great. Guys. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. Thank you so much. Big hugs to you yeah. and your family, brother. Thanks. All Thank right. You. See you. Thank Call you. me Queen of Carnage. I will beat your ass. This is my time. Busting doors. Breaking glass. Ceilings. And I like to play. They used to call me a lunder blade, but not anymore. I am Medusa and always will be Medusa. And that's what I think of the woman's championship belt. I'll hail the mother trucking queen.